side of the Attentify platform in addition to the vendors and highlights of this year's sponsors. The sponsors for the 2021 NTS are USAA, Boeing, College Board, AT&T, the Association of Military Banks of America, Military Benefit Association, Tutor.com, the Defense Credit Union Council, and BAE Systems. Again, welcome to the Welcome to day two, and please join me in welcoming the President and CEO of the Military Child Education Coalition, Dr. Becky Porter. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of our national training seminar. This year, our theme is College, Work, and Life Ready, Embracing the Future for Mill Kids. We've seen our military take huge steps forward with a renewed focus on science that's demonstrated by Army's Futures Command and the creation of Space Force. For MSEC, our Science Advisory Board works along these lines as well, using scientific expertise to guide our approach to design and implementation of programs and services in support of military-connected children. And now, I'm really proud to introduce you to Dr. Tricia Lester. She's a co-chair for the MSEC Science Advisory Board. Dr. Lester? Good morning. Thank you, Becky. I'm pleased to be here this morning with all of you. More than a decade ago, the MSEC Science Advisory Board was established with the aim of informing MSEC's initiatives and programs with the best scientific information about issues related to the health and well being of military children and their families. Dr. Miller, Mary Keller, an MSEC co founder and former CEO, and MSEC's Board of Directors recognized then the importance of using good science to shape its programs and formed a board of distinguished scientists and scholars committed to bringing evidence-based practices to military children. In recognition of the importance of good science for good practice, in 2019, the members of the Science Advisory Board unanimously recommended that MSEC establish the MSEC Mary Keller Award for Distinguished Contributions to Science. Through this award, the Science Advisory Board's goal is really twofold. One, to recognize outstanding achievement, and two, to encourage future scholarship through collaborations. Presented annually, this award recognizes a person or organization that best exemplifies a commitment to using the best of science to provide programs and services to military children and their families. Serving as a co-chair of the MSEC Science Advisory Board, I am honored um, and pleased to announce the 2021 recipient of the Mary Keller Award for Distinguished Contributions to Science is Mrs. Patricia Barron, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Military Community and Family Policy. And I wanna share a little bit about Patty with you today. Patty has had, Patty Barron has had an unwavering commitment to military families and children and demonstrated a passion for serving them throughout her career. First and foremost, as a military spouse and a mother, and later as an advocate and leader in a variety of service organizations. Patty's presence and work has left a lasting impact at every level. In her previous roles as Director of Outreach for Military Family Projects at Zero to Three, as Director of Youth Initiatives at NMFA, where she oversaw the development of the Operation Purple Camps, and most recently as Director of the Family Readiness Directorate at AUSA, Patty has committed herself to initiating and overseeing programs grounded in evidence-based science and benefiting military-connected children and families. Her legacy of service and her heart uh, for military families is truly unmatched and is unquestionably an exemplar of good science for good practice for the sake of the child. So I hope you'll all join me today um, in honoring uh, Mary, the honoring um, Ms. Pat Patricia Barron for the 2021 Mary Keller Award for Distinguished Contributions to Science. Please join me in welcoming Patty. Thank you so very much, Dr. Lester. I also want to thank Dr. Koza and Dr. Porter and the entire M6 uh, Science Advisory Board. This is such an honor and it's really an unexpected one. 
To be given an award after a role model of mine, Dr. Mary Keller, is absolutely amazing. And the phenomenal icing on the cake is to be presented this award by you, my dear friend, Dr. Lester. I'm really not sure my heart can stand it. It is so full right now. The Military Child Education Coalition is, to my mind, the gold standard of nonprofits focused on issues impacting the education of our military kids. Having raised three kids in the military family and now the grandmother of two absolutely adorable Army kids, these issues could not be more important to me. Every military child has and will benefit from MSEC's leadership and advocacy. And as a parent, grandparent, advocate, and now a senior leader in the Department of Defense, I want to thank you and I look forward to working together on behalf of our most precious charge, our military children. Thank you so very much again. This is truly an honor. And base for you. On behalf of our nation's military connected children, MSEC is proud to recognize you and your contributions through many years of service. We value our partnership and long-standing friendship with you and look forward to exciting opportunities to collaborate more in the future. Congratulations, Patty. And now I'm really excited to begin our first master class of the day and present Lieutenant General Retired Bob Caslin and West Point Professor of Engineering Psychology, Dr. Mike Matthews. General Caslin previously served as the President of the University of South Carolina and Superintendent of the United States Military Academy. During his time at West Point, General Caslin established the Centers of Excellence and developed an integration between Army Applied Problem Sets, West Point Research, and Intellectual Capital. Dr. Mike Matthews previously served as President of the American Psychological Association's Society for Military Psychology from 2007 to 2008 and is a Templeton Foundation Senior Positive Psychology Fellow. He's authored more than 250 papers and books. Dr. Matthews and General Caslin's book, The Character Edge, Leading and Winning with Integrity, is the subject of this master class. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming General Bob Caslin and Dr. Mike Matthews. I hear you, Becky. It's great to be with you. Thank you. And, um, and it was just, it was a real pleasure to read. I'm, I've uh, purchased several copies of it since then and have started giving it as a gift to, um, to friends of mine who I feel are um, great leaders and could reference that in, the, in their work that they do. So thank you both for putting it together. Um, it really approaches the topic of leading and winning with integrity in a way that combines General Caslin's countless experiences um, and, and it, looks at Mike's reference or Mike's experiences um, in research on positive psychology and evidence-informed theory on character development. How did the two of you decide to put your experience and your research together to write this book? Well, Bob, you want me to jump in here and, and begin the discussion of that? Because I guess you can blame me for it initially. I uh, have been doing science at uh, basic Basic, basic science, science at West, West Point, Point since about 2003, 2003 on assessing, assessing character, character strengths, strengths uh, among cadets, cadets and, uh, and uh, studying, studying how, how character, character uh, uh, traits, traits such as honesty, honesty and integrity and courage and, courage and particularly grit, grit, how they predict how well cadets do in the classroom, but also uh, uh, later out in the Army and in sports in a variety of ways. And by the summer of 2018, I, I did this idea that uh, 
it's time to take all that research and the other readings I've done on in character and put it into a format of a book that would be something that um, that um, all readers could enjoy and make sense of it as opposed to a journal article, which is often heavily statistical and scientific and theoretical. But I knew I couldn't write the book by myself and make it that way. And so I knew I could cover the science of character, but I needed a partner in this. And so I thought for about three nanoseconds and came up with the idea of uh, Lieutenant General Bob Caslin, who was still our, our superintendent at the time. So I emailed him uh, on a, I believe it was a Sunday. I still have his email reply. And I told him about the book and he wrote back this one sentence reply. He said, put me in coach. And so I'll let Bob give his reflection on that. But the idea was to marry up my, my science with his practical experience. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Becky, and Becky again. It's really great to be with you, Mike. It's wonderful to see you again. So I think you captured it pretty well, but from my perspective, um, I realized how important character was in leadership and effective leadership. And as we were in the business of developing future leaders, we realized that character had to be a critical component of that develop development. And so uh, the five years I was a superintendent was really my cornerstone to really develop character on how to develop character in aspiring young men and women who would be leaders uh, in national service. And uh, so the practical application that we had and then the practical applications that I had experienced in my time in the military, when you said that you were going to do the science and I, all I had to do was tell the stories, I said, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an easy <laughs> task to do. And I was glad to do it. But uh, it was uh, really an honor to be able to partner with you, Mike, on that, on this project. No, the honor is mine, for sure. We're glad that you both did. Uh, and, and we've been actually, for folks in the, in the audience who don't know, we've been trying to get General Caslin and Dr. Matthews here for quite a while uh, to speak to NTS and just things kept getting switched and changed. And so now we're, we're happy that you're finally here. Um, in May though, sir, General Caslin, this, this question is for you. Um, there were, uh, you were the, the president at the University of South Carolina and there were allegations that in your commencement speech, you plagiarized Admiral Retired McRaven. And, um, and you very shortly thereafter tendered your resignation. And, um, and to be honest, some people approached me and said, well, now what are you going to do for a speaker on character? And, um, and my, my perspective was, well, this is perfect. But I'll let you respond to that, those kinds of questions and those kinds of thoughts. Well, it gave me an opportunity to execute what I had talked about in the book. But, but you know, when you write a book and you, you write about character success and character failures, and now all of a sudden you, you become the subject of what you have written about, it kind of is a sobering uh, dynamic in itself, and it, and it really has been. But, but nevertheless, the facts of what actually took place was that, and this was not a commencement speech, I was just the president of the university hosting the commencement event and the commencement ceremony. And in my final comments, right before we dismissed everybody, after the speaker, after the diplomas and all that, I was trying to give some words of encouragement. Uh, commencement at University of South Carolina is a, is a five day, 15 event activity because we not only do University of South Carolina, we do different colleges. We're also a system. We have three, we had, we had uh, three other universities that we participated in their events with as well. Uh, halfway through that repertoire, I realized that the one topic that really needed to be mentioned to the students was to commend them on their resilience in the pandemic, because all of these students that were graduating had really received their diploma their senior year or their final year this past year. And to have done it in the midst of the pandemic was something I thought needed to be commended. So I have this big file of uh, quotes and uh, speeches. And matter of fact, in preparation for my comments, I had given my speechwriter all of that information. And I said, I need uh, some quotes on resilience and encouragement and resilience. And the one quote that popped to the top was McCraven's. Uh, so I had given that to her, she put it in, it was not attributed. I did not realize it was not attributed. Frankly, it's my fault, I didn't even pay attention. First time I realized that we had failed to attribute was when I read about it in the newspapers. But you know, this is not an issue of trying to find someone else to put the blame on. I am the leader. I was the one that had said it without attribution. 
It is totally my responsibility. And that's what leaders have to do. They have to accept responsibilities. Whenever you're successful as a leader, you pass that success to your organization and your team so they can celebrate their success. And whenever, the, the, whenever you fail, you as a leader must take responsibility. And when you take responsibility of the failure, you have to take responsibility of the consequence. And the consequence really came about through the through watching the dynamic and the social media and, and 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 you know as a background you realize that if you look at my board vote for me to get there it was very controversial and it was almost a 50 50 split in itself so there's a lot of people out there did not want me to be the president so when they were looking for a, a reason to be able to pounce this was the perfect reason and they did and they did it with social media it exploded went viral and I told my uh, my board chair, I said, you know, at some particular point, effective leadership really depends on trust. And when trust is lost, then you're no longer effective as a leader. And if I if I get to the point where I'm losing trust with constituents at the university, whether they're uh, students or faculty or even legislators, since it's a public university, then you really then then the effectiveness as I as me as a leader is gets to that particular point where I really got to make a decision whether my presence still in this university is worth it. And I realized quickly that because this thing was going viral, even at the national level, that uh, effectiveness and leadership because of a, lo a lack of trust is time to put somebody else in there. And that's why I realized that it's best for the university, not for me. It's best for the university they find somebody else. And that's why I submitted my resignation. So really, this is a pathway as I work my way with character and integrity as a backdrop all the way through my decision to finally uh, resign from the university. And it is what it is, you know. So I accept my uh, mistake and I also accept the consequences of the mistake. And I believe that's what leaders have to do. Well, sir, I, I appreciate your willingness to walk us through that and share that with us. And um, I'm, I think it, it's an example of everything that's in the book, the way that you responded to that event. Um, but it makes me wonder, um, and this could be for either of you, um, who was this book written for? Was it for parents, for educators, for even for, I mean, we, we have uh, students, military connected students as our constituents. Do you think there's applicability for those audiences of this book? I'll just say uh, that my vision was, and as we wrote this, we tried to give examples from all of those, all of those that you gave, the things that would ring true with parents and, and educators and people who work in professional sports or college sports, um, you know, just the really uh, religious institutions, probably the whole gamut of, of things we as human beings do. So, so the answer is that the book really, I mean, character is universal, so it's, it transcends any specific sort of domain or stovepipe. So we wanted to speak to to everybody. I think it's very relevant, extremely relevant though, to educators and, and parents with a with a uh, stake in, in raising children, any children, especially military children, given the uh, sometimes the unique obstacles and challenges they have to deal with. Yeah, if I could jump in there, Becky, please. And, and, and Mike is exactly right. But you know, in the business of developing leaders, you've got to understand what makes them effective and as i said previously effectiveness comes from building a trust relationship with their those whom they lead and those whom they're accountable to and trust is a function of really not only having your act together by being competent but it's also a function of your character because when you lose when you lose trust you lose effectiveness and it's simple as that and and of course the, the scenario i just explained to you is a perfect example of that so leadership is so important on being effective and effectiveness must include your character because of the trust relationships you have to develop. Now, that's universal, as Mike said. It's not just in the military and future aspiring military leaders. It's whether you're in the corporate world or whether you're in government service or you name it. Uh, that principle of effective leadership by building trust relationships is critically important. Yeah, so building trust relationships and, and leading with character, um, I get from both of you and from the book, how would you advise or recommend um, educators to instill that kind of environment um, for their students?
Bob, you want to step on that and I'll go? Well, you know, it's kind of Becky, what I kind of what I was saying there. You know, it, um, an, an educator has got to have the character to be able to uh, hold themselves accountable, and then and then to be able to understand what are the character traits that the people that I'm uh, I'm involved with in teaching and developing. What are the character traits that are necessary in their development? You know, the book that I, th I give the credit to Mike because this was his design. He talks about credit. Uh, I mean, character of the gut, character of the head, character of the heart. And when you dig into the traits of each one of these particular areas, if you're going to be a successful leader and you as a as a teacher in education have the responsibility not only to express and and, and back these traits up, but to be able to take responsibility of developing them. You really understand that you you as a leader don't have a have a responsibility just to stand on the sideline and let it develop by itself. You have a responsibility as a leader to be part of that development. Yeah, let's jump in and say you know for the educators there, character is an interesting thing to try to 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 teach, right? And so let's say you're a math teacher or a science teacher, or some or English or whatever this, the topic might be. You know, ostensibly the topic of the class is math, and maybe you don't think so much day to day about developing a character among your students. But let me draw an analogy back to West Point. So at West Point, we have, Bob probably knows the exact number, I should. We've, I think we've got 13 academic departments. Uh, there's like 35 different academic majors, like you'd find about anywhere. Let me give you an example from my own case. So I teach in what's called the engineering psychology programs, human factors engineering. And the main course I teach in the fall is called biopsychology. On the face of that, that doesn't sound very much like, like character or leadership. But in fact, you know, every, every instructor and, and professor at West Point, no matter what academic topic they're teaching, they're teaching leadership. So, so I, I frame biopsychology examples from the standpoint of leadership. And I think there's an analogy to that to character. So if you teach math, you've got theorems and postulates. If you teach physics, you've got the theory of relativity. You know, and you go to every every science and discipline has these theories and concepts that supports education. Only recently, though, is there sort of something akin to the table of elements of character. So, so now the science of character has matured to the point where educators can familiarize themselves with what we describe in the second chapter of the book, which is a classification scheme of characters and, and realize it's more than just not lie, cheat, or steal. There's like many, many dimensions to it. And armed with that knowledge, you can look for opportunities to frame questions in the classroom or, or targets of opportunities, you might say, in the military to induce uh, students, whether, whether they're studying, again, whatever topic they're ostensibly in the class for, to reflect on these values and, and, uh, and virtues as well. So I'll just close saying I, I think the um, useful acronym is EFRD, educate okay, yourself and the, and the students about the structure of character. Uh, F is frame, EF is frame. So frame some of the discussion around the context of character. Reflect is the, as the third part of the acronym. And the last part is practice, provides to your students lots of chances to, uh, to practice a character development. It's a start. Again, you don't have to be teaching a course in character to do that. You can do that in almost any context. Well, thanks, Mike. I mean, that, that also kind of makes me think of um, something I wanted to ask General Caslin about, which, you know, it, it's, it's in the book that the two of you wrote, um, General Douglas MacArthur being quoted as saying, on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other days on other fields will bear the, the fruits of victory. And anybody who's who's been a, um, a cadet at West Point or even been assigned at West Point has heard that quotation. And I wanted to ask General Caslin specifically, sir, how would you, um, you know, it's pretty clear, you can, you can pretty easily, I think, make that connection and why that's an important quotation for a, a future military leader. But what about for kids and, and even adults who are aspiring to develop character in themselves and those around them? How does it apply for them? Uh, thanks, Becky. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole book. Um, you know, because it really is not so much succeeding on the athletic field, as MacArthur says, on other fields at other times will bear the fruits of victory. He's thinking about war 
and combat operations in the crucible principally of ground combat and leading America's sons and daughters in that crucible. But really the application of, in a broader sense is, in my opinion, is all about the chapter character of the gut, which has to do with resilience and perseverance. perseverance. And as Angela Duckworth, one of our colleagues says, grit. To be able to overcome challenges, to persevere, to to never quit, to just keep going. And no matter what it takes, no matter what, who's out there on the sidelines uh, harassing and yelling, that you've got the perseverance and the resilience to be able to persevere and to accomplish the mission and accomplish whatever tasks that you put out there. You know, so everybody in this podcast that's listening knows for sure that life is not a bed of roses. It is got its ups and its downs. And there's going to be challenges in life, whether you're in the military leading or whether you're doing something else or just being a mom or dad or a husband or a wife, there's going to be challenges out there and how you deal with those challenges and how you persevere and how you have the resilience when, when this type of stuff happens is uh, tremendously important. It really helps to define your character and who you are. That's called character of the gut. You know, the, the, on the athletic field though, that's worth mentioning about the athletic field. The athletic field is a, is a great tool to develop that type of character and those character traits into future young men and women and future leaders, whether they're going to the military or not, because the athletic field is just, is, is got tremendous amounts of successes and failures. And anybody that has played a sport realizes that we fail individually. We failed as a team, but it's not that you fail. It's how you react once you do fail and how you recover. So, um, so that, so what MacArthur says about the fields of friendly strife, how important they are in your character development to be able to develop the perseverance and resilience and tenacity and grit to be able to not only persevere, but to successfully accomplish the mission under the worst of circumstances, um, athletics, whether you're in the military, going to be a future military leader, or whether you're just a young man or woman playing sports at your local high school, athletics is a key component to develop those skills. Yeah. I I can't can't help oh, go ahead, Mike. I just I can't, I can't help, help thinking, thinking about Bob's comments and, and a, about the adversities that we've all faced in the last 18 months with the pandemic. So that's a case in point. Doesn't you know? It wasn't just the military that dealt with the pandemic. It wasn't just educators. It was everybody, and, and still in. All too many people are still, you know, sort of under the, under that pressure, and, and the uh, taking these lessons, these strengths of the the heart, love and love and kindness and caring for others, and strengths of the gut, as Bob has mentioned, uh, grit and courage, and strengths of the of the head, which means like wisdom and knowledge and love of learning. You can you can go across those three bends of strengths and and marshal those towards a successful. Um, resolution of, of challenges that, that life presents the pandemic being a, I think we can, an example we can all share. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, and, and I think, um, Mike, as I was reading the book, I mean, uh, and I didn't realize this would be in there until I was reading it, that you commented uh, specifically, Mike, about the character building opportunity that you think uh, student to student or S2S provides an MSEC program that has been around for a long time. Uh, and I was reading and I was like, oh, Mike talked about it here. So can you tell us what it is you think about S2S that is such a great character building opportunity? Yeah, in fact, there may be some of the students listening today who've been part of my S2S workshops I've done the last couple of three years. And, and certainly some of the educators may know a bit about it, but let me just describe as an example. So you know, when I said uh, that little acronym, educate, frame, reflect, and practice, the idea was is that I've taken um, either live prior to 2020, in 2018, 2019, and maybe before that, we would have groups of S2S students at the National Training Seminar, usually about 30 at a time, come in, and I'd, I'd spend about, oh, 15 or 20 minutes educating them about the science of character. And then I'd pose for them, uh, you know, practical sorts of challenges that, that kids at their age, and these were sophomores and juniors and seniors, rising seniors in high school, the kinds of things that, you know, that they may have to encounter, you know, on a dramatic side, maybe the death of a friend, you know, or a divorce of a parent or a particularly hard class or some big disappointment in life or didn't make the team, whatever it might be. 
then we break into groups and, and ask them to, to explain uh, or describe a program, how you could use a particular set of character strings to help you overcome that challenge. And so that was sort of the reflection part. We, we uh, educated, we framed, reflected, and then asked them to go out and you know, hopefully and practice these skills once they, they left that. So I think, I think um, Becky, what that does for the kids in S2S and, and really would fit work anywhere, it allows kids to have a narrative uh, and, a, and a sense in this narrative of the importance of character in dealing with life's challenges. And secondarily to the narrative, it provides them a toolbox. So they don't have just two or three strengths, they have up to 24, we think, uh, the scientists who developed uh, this classification scheme, uh, Peterson and Seligman, think there are 24 character strengths. And as you educate yourself about those 24 strengths and look at them as a tool, not every job requires a hammer, some require you know, a file and some require a screwdriver and some require a wrench. And life is like that too. To excel in a difficult academic challenge requires strengths of the head, right? So love of learning. To deal with the, the loss of a loved one requires strength of the heart and so forth. So I think that that's really the value, um, Becky and, and all who are listening, is, is providing kids with this narrative and uh, this notion of a toolbox. Well, thanks for that, Mike. I, I, I agree with you. And I, it makes me think about an, an experience that I had when I was stationed at West Point as a lieutenant colonel, and I worked for Brigadier General Caslin at the time. He was the commandant for the Corps Cadets. And I worked with the women's rugby team. Uh, and so when one of them got in trouble, I went with them <laughs> to see the commandant. And she was, she had, um, she was in trouble because she had um, basically lied and said that her roommate had gotten in into their room before taps and she had helped to falsify um, where where her roommate was when she actually was not in her room by the time she was supposed to be. And when I went with her before uh, General Caslin to, um, to find out how this was going to be uh, dealt with at the academy, she told him that um, she felt her she felt justified in her behavior because she was demonstrating loyalty to her teammate, and um, and General Caslin's response to that stuck with me. Um, that it's been, sir, I think 15 years since that experience, and um, and I I wondered if you could talk a little bit. If you don't remember exactly what you said, can you remember what you might have said? to somebody who said they were demonstrating uh, loyalty to a teammate in those circumstances? Becky, you're doing such a good job telling the story. I think I ought to let you just finish it. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, no, seriously, thanks for the heads up because I did have to remember a little bit. And uh, and I, I don't recall the specific situation. I do recall the topic and the issue that uh, cadets faced all the time. And frankly, that's what young children face. You know, it's the peer pressure that creates loyalties with friends. And those loyalties may surround a set of values that are maybe inconsistent with the institution values. So you end up finding yourself in the middle of a conflict of loyalties. So how do you resolve that? You know, when you have a set of institutional values, duty, honor, country, and then you have values for subgroups and those those values are not consistent with this how do you deal with that how do you resolve it if you're a young high school kid or or a college student like the one that you were talking about becky you're going to be faced with conflicts of loyalty all the time and for those of us who are adults thinking that we're not faced with conflicts of loyalty we are and how do you resolve them and, and how do you work your way through them you know we always say that if you're involved in a subculture and the subculture has a set of values that are inconsistent with the institutional values look at why you're there and and where you stand with respect to the values that are inconsistent because subcultures are normally good normally subcultures you just think of a football team for example they got values of toughness and tenacity and those value sets are good and they're consistent with values of you know, future military leaders and what we expect of our leaders for character of the gut and the crucible of ground combat. 
But if all of a sudden you find yourself in a subculture and you have a set of values, disrespect, disloyalties that are inconsistent with uh, institution values. And in, in this case that you're talking about, Becky, here's a young lady that had that was trying to bail out a roommate to a point where she was going to be forced to tell a story that was not true, which is inconsistent with the duty on our country values of our institution. How do you resolve that? And the fact is it needs to be resolved. You can't look the other way and you can't, if you fall, if you find yourself embracing subculture values that are inconsistent, that's a big warning sign. What we, we see, we saw this often at West Point and maybe not often, but we saw it periodically. And it was something that we really had to address. One of the ways I did that as a superintendent is we took anonymous surveys of every single club, athletic team, club team, or whatever. And we were getting good information from an anonymous survey, whether or not you had a value set in there. And then we would get take those results and give them to the team captain and also the officer rep and coach so that they had the ability to really understand where their values were with respect to institution values so that they can be able to address them if there were concerns that were out there. You know, it's so interesting, it's interesting uh, uh, Becky, Becky, from my from perspective as a professor, and I, I think Bob can reinforce this. At a place like West Point, I think it's true in many educational institutions, that even high schools and K through 12, you know, I don't think I've personally ever had a cadet fail a class because of lack of ability. It's, it's always been ultimately go to the core of some character issue, lack of grit, lack of determination, I've heard certainly had a few honesty issues. And so, you know, when, when you look at it from the superintendent's perspective, I'd like, you know, if you want to comment on that, Bob, you can. You know, there's probably, you know, 20% of the incoming class don't graduate from the day they, they arrive at West Point until 47 months, 47 months later. But I thought probably 10 of those might be physical, Bob, you know, five or 10 have broken a leg, it doesn't heal right. And there might be a very small handful who just cognitively don't have the skills to, uh, to do it. But our admissions program department does a great job of getting the smart, smart cadets. So it's almost always comes back to the things that Bob's talking about. And I, and I suspect that educators here are nodding their heads in agreement uh, as we speak. Yeah, I, I suspect that there are probably parents in the audience who would say the same thing, that there's, there's ability and then there's how that ability is used um, with the foundation of character and integrity. And that's really what I liked about um, the book is how it weaves the it weaves together the theory and the science with the with the stories and the observations. But I wanted to ask you, Mike, um, what are some of the specific tenets of uh, or the salient parts of your research or the relevant research that you would like the audience to to be aware of? I think there's maybe three things or three and a half. We we'll see how it comes out. Um, when I've reflected on this question, I think there's three, the three most important things to walk away from the science, my science of, uh, of character, my research I've done the last almost 20 years, is that there is this really, I think, useful classification scheme. I've alluded to this before, uh, that classifies uh, 24 character strengths into one of six sort of superordinate moral virtues. And these are moral virtues are things like wisdom and knowledge and humanity and transcendence and courage and you read the book and, and see the rest of it. So it's useful to have that. It's useful to know what the left and right limits of character are. And it's more than just lie, cheat, or steal. Okay, there's a lot more nuance to character than, than, than you might, might at first think. So that's good to be able to classify, but so what? So part of the so what is the second piece is um, over and over again in my research and in collaboration with people like Angela Duckworth from, uh, from Penn and, and other places, other researchers from other places. The, uh, the second point is that these character traits that we can assess and, and classify do matter. They matter in how well you do. So for example, grit, uh, which is the passionate pursuit of long-term goals, uh, is, a, is the only predictor of which cadets of the roughly 1,250 we bring in each summer of those who complete cadet basic training, a very rigorous sort of uh, introduction to military culture, you could say. So the point being that uh, that grit and other strengths matter in terms of predicting who's going to do well and, and who may do not so well. And then, and then the third thing, and this is really important too, this may be the most important part, 
is these traits are teachable. You know, so there's a growing science of, of, of how to teach and educate kids about, about character. Now we've all, I mean, when we were little kids, we heard about, we read the story about the little engine who could, right? Little engine that could, it's, it's in our literature. And, you know, we, we, we address character and religion and literature and scouting in lots of ways, but we don't do it very systematically. So one of the phenomena, a very positive thing that's happening now uh, that I see is more and more entities are coming up, commercial or, or nonprofit, that go into the schools and help schools develop a, develop a character curriculum. So one example is, is uh, a West Point graduate, Mike Irwin, has founded something called the Positivity Project. If you're all taking notes, go, go Google about the Positivity Project. It's, it's high power. And they'll come into school K through 12 and have a one year curriculum covering each of the 24 character strengths. And it doesn't need up a ton of time, but it goes back to my model, it's my acronym EFRD, the educate piece. You can educate kids systematically about it. So uh, summarize, you can classify it and measure it. You can, it matters and you can teach it. Oh, thanks, Mike. I, I wrote down, well, I, I actually know Mike Irwin, and I wrote down maybe for next year's National Training Seminar, we should invite Mike to, to present. Um, before, before I turn to whatever questions we have in the chat box, I wanted to ask um, both of you if you had any specific advice that you would give to, especially to military-connected children. Um, as you know, we all know, um, General Caslin, I know that you your children grew up in a military environment, and um, and if your if your one son is still in the army, he's probably raising military kids himself. What advice would you give to uh, your grandchildren or any uh, military connected kids? Thanks, Becky. I do. I have three young men that have all grown up in the military. They're well, they're uh, adult children now. Uh, one of them's in his actually two of them are in their forties now. The, uh, um, I would say a couple things. Um, first of all, the foundation of their development really was the family, uh, because they're so tran transient that they make friends, they break friends, they're in school, they're out of school. My oldest son went to four high schools. My other two sons went to three high schools and for each of them for four years. So, so you know, it's at that vulnerable stage of adolescence where they're making friends, breaking friends over and over and over again. But the foundation of the values of their development really has got to be the, the family and how important that family is. Now, we all know that not all families are very, very successful. And and, and this program, the, what you're doing, Becky, and having this organization to, to support families and to really focus on military children and their development to be successful in societies is really phenomenal. But, you know, because of that transient, they learn resilience. They learn how to make friends quickly. They learn social skills that they otherwise wouldn't. And they ought to take advantage of their ability to do that, particularly as they go off into higher education and elsewhere. The other thing that I think that's tremendously important is uh, to have as a family the hard discussions and the hard talks, because as they are transient going in and out of schools are going to be going in and out of what I had mentioned before, these subcultures among students that are out there. And sometimes they'll be in the middle of a subculture and want to be accepted within that subculture because, you know, they're new to that school. And, and when they try to be accepted in that subculture, they find themselves compromising maybe some of the values they learned at home. So it's important for mom and dad, and this is, this is important, not only to have the hard discussions with their sons and daughters, but to earn the right to have their sons and daughters listen to them. You can talk to your son and daughter, but it's really up to your son and daughter to listen to you or not. But how do you really earn the right to be able to have your son and daughter listen to you? And really the answer is just, and this is, was a conflict for me in the military, it was just, massive amounts of time to really earn their respect and trust. And when you get to that particular point for a conversation that they're really listening because they respect you so much as their mom and dad and they trust you, not because you are their mom and dad, but because you have earned their trust, then you're really effective as a parent. And that's uh, tremendously important. 
in their development as well. And lastly, a practical suggestion is get them to read, read, just read again and again and again. I'm absolutely convinced that one of the greatest skill sets for success intellectually is the ability to read and to comprehend. And as they bounce around from one school to another school to another school, you know, the people they're going to be telling them to read a lot and not a teacher because they're only with a teacher for a year or two. It's going to be mom and dad. So mom and dad's really got to encourage young kids to be able to read and read and read and develop that habit and a love for reading, because I think that's tremendously important. All right. I'll stop there. I'm sure Mike's got some thoughts and ideas as yes, well. As well. Well, 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 Bob, Bob Eckert, that's, that's so eloquently, eloquently said. said. I'm, not I'm not sure, sure I can say, say anything, anything that, that, could, that could add to that a lot. lot. I, um, I, I, I think I, I would, think the only thing I would say, I'd keep it much briefer, my comments, is, um, you know, my model, I talk about educating and framing, you know, mil military members have a unique opportunity with their children uh, to face obstacles or challenges things that can be difficult to do, but once overcome uh, and viewed as a challenge, make them stronger and better. And so I think um, not just parents, but educators of military children, if they can, to the extent they can help military kids frame their unique experiences, somewhat unique experience. There are plenty of corporates, corporations that move people around a lot too. Usually in corporations, parents aren't likely to go to a war zone and get, get hurt or killed, granted. But the extent that you can 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 help children of any age all the way up through teens frame their experiences as a as a positive challenge and a way to become stronger and better um, i think that that goes a long way is towards uh, leading them to the path of long-term success oh thanks mike i i think that um both of your comments kind of um underscore for me the importance for parents and for educators and for any of us that um, it, leading a life of character and integrity is is aspirational and ongoing. It's not like you get there and you're done. You're going to continuously and repeatedly be faced with um, situations where you get to apply apply the foundations of character and integrity going forward. And I think that, that um, right now we have a little bit of time left for some questions uh, in the audience. And so um, I'd like to... Um, to, to pose the first one. Uh, the question is, in a time of so much transition and opposing voices, young people are trying to figure out what integrity looks like. What do you wish you could say to young people about the importance of character? Yeah, I'll yeah, start. I'll start. Well, well, you know, there, it's a lot of people say, well, what does character really talk about? What does it mean? Mike's got a great definition in the book is that he uses. You know, the way I, I really see it is integrity becomes a critical part of that. But integrity is saying the right thing, doing the right thing. And, at, you know, at West Point, we would have the cadet prayer. And then the cadet prayer says to always do the harder right, to recognize when you're in the middle of a conflict and making the decision to do the harder right, not the easier wrong. And integrity... You know, the, the derivative of integrity is integer. And if you look at an integer, integer means whole, whole number. So you are a whole person. You're complete. So you're not just speaking off the side of your mouth. You're speaking from your heart. You're speaking from yourself. So that when you do speak, particularly in a conflicting type of situations, you're speaking truth. And when you speak truth, then you're a person of integrity because people recognize that you're speaking the truth and you do that by being transparent as well. So, so integrity in, you know, and at West Point, we also have the word in our motto, duty, honor and country and honor and integrity are intricately linked together. And we always say honor is always doing the right thing, even when nobody is looking. And that's, uh, that's where you get uh, kind of integrity and honor out of that. But Mike, can look at it from an academic perspective. He's perfect in that regard, and he'll give you a better answer than I did. So, no, 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 untrue. I cannot give a better answer than that. I, the thought that comes to mind, though, and reflecting what you were saying, Bob, is that the challenges kids today have from I don't know what the age from eight or nine up is social media. You know, once once they get a hold in, involved in social media, and you know, you can say things and and. Uh, espouse views on social media that you wouldn't say to your parents 
or to an educator. And, you know, you've run into that as superintendent all too frequently, uh, the, uh, the impact of that. And how do you get young people to understand that there needs to be an alignment between their true self uh, and the self that they project out on these social media platforms. You know, you know, they're up at one o'clock in the morning, they see something off off the wall because they're upset or just not thinking about it. It lives forever you know, out on the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the social media world. So I think that's a, just a challenge that, that we all of us collectively have to, have to struggle with. Definitely. Here, here's the next question that came up in the chat. How do you think COVID has strengthened character in all of us as we tr transition back to the normal? What character hurdles do you anticipate related to COVID? Let, let me just Let jump in that to start, start with. with. The, 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 the message, message I'd like to get across is, is that, that there are people, uh, and, and in no small number, who are going to who have have and will suffer uh, sort of pathology or or negative impacts of resulting from this pandemic? So we don't want to deny that. So I mean, there, there's there's people who are going to have uh, children and adults alike who may become depressed or more depressed, or may have some disruption of their social lives and and through that have a difficult or more difficult time uh, adjusting. But the good news is is that's a is about the bad news and the good news. The, the, the bad news is that's maybe 10% of the population. 90% of the population will either come through as sort of unaffected or they'll actually show what scientists call post-traumatic growth. And so I think part of uh, winning uh, in this pandemic is to recognize that, yes, you may be stressed out and there may be problems and there may be some things that are worse, but to reflect, again, it's come back to my model, to reflect upon those ways in which you're better. So a lot of people are saying, I value my family more. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm more, more thoughtful of day to day basis. We're running out of time, so I can't go through this, this too much. There's a lot of good that could, could come from this if we allow it to, to be so. Over. Thanks, Mike. Since we, since we are just about at the end of our time together, I wanted to offer um, General Caslin, is there anything, any closing remarks that you'd like to make? Well, well, Becky, let, let me just let say, me thank, say you thank you very much for what you and, and, and your, your organization, organization is doing. doing. I mean, <laughs> having been a parent and served in the military and raised my children in the military, uh, what you are all about is so tremendously important. And the impact that you're having on the lives of future young men and women, whether they go in the military like the mom and dad or whether they go into the corporate world or elsewhere, they're going to be contributing members in society because they have great self-esteem and great understanding and they are comfortable in very challenging environments because of the traits that you're helping them to develop so character being one of those traits so thanks for what you're doing and it was an honor to be with you today now, I'd, I'd echo that, that. Go ahead, Mike. and just, and just point out that in my own history of this my connection with MSEC began i think in 2001 could have been 2002 nearly 20 years ago when my department uh, appointed uh, General Eric or Rick Shinseki, who recently retired as Chief of Staff of the Army, to be a visiting professor in our department. And he brought along this person named Patty. Some of you may have heard of Patty Shinseki. She's a dynamic force along with Mary, Henry Keller. And it wasn't too long before I was sitting uh, having this great discussion with Patty. Because, you know, it, we, we brought General Shinseki in for obvious reasons, but the real win was getting Patty in, in the department for a couple of years. And and she launched my association with uh, with MSEC, and I'm so delighted and, and and full of gratitude that that's still going on 20 years later. So thanks, Becky, for allowing me to continue to play in the MSEC sandbox. Thank you. I'm. I think I was a playmate of yours in the sandbox way back then, and uh, and I'm happy what, to what? still be there. Um, thank you both, gentlemen. It's a, a fantastic, fantastic read that really has applications for so many of the people that we work with and work for. Um, thanks for joining us this morning and leading this great master class.